Hello, I'm Mark Halpern. Welcome to the Wide World of News' first reader conversation. We've gathered people from all over the United States to talk about what's going on in the country, in their communities, with their families. We're really pleased and grateful for having the people who have joined us today join us. We have, as I said, great regional diversity. We have people from all over the United States. I wish we had more racial diversity than we have. Uh, we took people who, who, who emailed in and volunteered to be on. In future conversations, we are going to do what we must do to find a way to have more racial diversity and other forms of diversity in this conversation. But this is a diverse group, as I said, geographically, and it's a diverse group in terms of life experience and professions and attitudes and age. So as I say, I'm happy to have everybody here with us. I want to start, even though we are in these difficult times, with good news. So many families, so many uh, communities have pulled together during this difficult time, and life goes on. Uh, things continue to happen. People to continue to get married. People continue to uh, uh, have positive things in their life. And I want to talk about one positive thing. Ari Middleman joins us. And Ari, tell everybody about the positive life experience you've had in the last few days. Uh, thank you, Mark. Actually, it was just uh, 46 hours ago. Uh, my incredible wife gave birth to an incredible baby girl. Oh, yay! <laughs> Congratulations. Hold it up a little higher, Ari. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, hey. She's finally sleeping, so I don't want to wake her up. Hey, well, Ari, what's her name? Thank you. Yeah, her name is El. It's a it's a Hebrew name. Uh, it's both biblical and modern Hebrew. Uh, my father's a rabbi. It's Eliora Galit, uh, which means a divine light, and Galit means wave. Yeah. And ah. we all use a little light during these dark times, and we hope that uh, she makes waves in a good way. Um, Ari and his wife, Tara Brown, they live in, in Pikesville, Maryland, and, and uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but they, they have chosen to uh, voluntarily take temporary pay cuts as they work from home and, and in, this, in this incredible time in their life. So Ari, congratulations. I'm wondering if anyone else would like to share something positive that's happened in your family, in your community over the last month or so uh, that has given you a sense of optimism and continuity. Does anybody have anything like that they can share with us? Yes, Mark, this is Bill uh, from Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, our grandniece recently gave birth, I think it was last week, to her second child who was born with complications. Oh. And we got the great news today that the wonderful physicians and nurses and the NICU at the hospital where they are uh, isolated the problem and it looks like uh, everything's going to be okay from here on out. We're very happy. That's great news. I would like That's to just news. ask uh, both of these men, did um, Ari, did your wife and um, uh, uh, Bill, um, did your grandniece, um, did they both give birth in the hospital? Because that's kind of an issue here. I'm from Connecticut and, and in New York, it's kind of an issue. And people are considering whether to give birth at home or um, you know, that there might be other, other ways of, of doing that. Did, did, did everyone, did both of the women give birth at the hospital? Yeah, Jeannie, we were, um joking, maybe the men were joking a little more than the women about doing it, and we actually opened up our backyard pool early. Um, but no, we were, uh, we were in a great hospital. Um, the security was, was incredibly tight, um, and uh, uh, my sense is the only folks that were coming in were, were COVID patients, uh, you know, real emergencies, and, and uh, expectant mothers. And uh, only one visitor, normally it was a five visitor policy, and um, head to toe PPE, and I'm happy to say that I was I was allowed to be the one visitor. So oh, great, great. And you, Bill, was that your similar experience? Uh, the grandniece gave birth in a different state, and she had to be in a regular hospital, and she had uh, some pregnancy complications. Ah, okay. What I can gather, uh, it was. Uh, a, a non-event instead in, in terms of COVID-19. I'm sure they took all the appropriate precautions. And uh, it's just you know such a scary time right now to have to go anywhere near a hospital. It's, um, we're, and we're gonna talk more about medical issues because uh, several of you have medical backgrounds. I wanna move from your own situations and it's some good news, I'm sure others of you have had good experience amidst all this to the country. And uh, uh, I wanna start with Joel Dennis out in Marysville, Washington. Uh, who uh, works in sales. Joel, just thinking, I know you probably have some concerns about how your state and how the country has dealt with this, but tell me something you see positive, the way the government and the society have been dealing with this challenge, the challenges we now face. Uh, 
everybody coming together. We kind of saw the leading edge of that out here. The first U.S. confirmed case was at Providence Medical Center, which is in Everett, uh, maybe about a 10 minute drive from where I'm at. Uh, then the original epicenter of the whole virus here in the States was Kirkland, Washington, where uh, Evergreen Medical Center was having the first handful of deaths in the country. Uh, that's about a mile away from where I work. That's the hospital yeah. where my wife and I had our child last summer. So we were kind of the leading wave of everything and just seeing all the people who started donating their time and energy to making masks and all the businesses before everything was put on lockdown, uh, contributing whatever materials, food that they could to the first line responders. So we kind of got to see the leading edge of how everybody's going to band together to support those who really needed it throughout this whole thing. My concern is that um, I don't feel that we have a lot of leadership uh, from the top in this administration and that for, there hasn't been, at least my impression is that we haven't um, really rallied around our leader the way we, you know, like they rallied around the queen, you know, when she gave that talk, people were all, you know, uh, in it with her. Um, and I wondered if what, you know, what other people thought about that. No, I think that's one of the most important questions and one of the things I want to discuss. Let me bring in Joseph Shoemaker, Joe Shoemaker in Davenport, uh, Iowa. Um, Joe, let me ask you, regardless of whether you support the president or if you think he's done a good job, if you could talk to him directly and give him one piece of advice, what a piece of advice would you give him? Well, today, uh, with where we're at, um, we can't go back what, for one thing and, you know, re-argue why we're here, where we're at today, for one thing. I think he's got to open the country. I think he's got to get Congress, the leaders together and say, we, we've got to get on the same page whether you like me or not. Uh, I think the adults need to start acting like adults and put Americans first because what I keep hearing is there's New Yorkers, there's people in Washington. It seems like we're broken up. We're not united. We might be working together locally, and I think that's where the where we're going to solve this. Right. Deal with it. But I, I'm really concerned about the absolute. I don't care what we think and who people think of the president. He is our president. But I but I know that half the country doesn't believe that, and that's a problem. And I think well, I, actually, smart thing, I, I think you did a smart thing. And I'll end with this: is by saying to the states, states, governors, you got to do most of this. Yeah, I want to take a little different a diff, different spin on that, Joseph. I, I don't believe that half the country doesn't believe he's the president. I think half the country may wish that he wasn't the president, but we all know and we all believe that he's the president. And I think that even people like me who don't support him uh, really wish for one thing, stop the divisiveness. You mentioned bringing the country together. He could do that if he wants to, but that's not in his personality. That's not what he's done in the last three years. And frankly, everything that he's doing right now appears to be geared toward one goal. And that's to him getting reelected in November. If he would stop that, and if he would bring people together, and if he would listen to the states and help answer their needs and gave them what they needed, or at least pretended to, I'm sure that he would see that people would actually rally around him and not what he's seeing now, which is the exact opposite, which is a lot of the countries actually running away from his leadership, which is a shame and a time of crisis. Yeah, that's Ray, Ray that just to say that's Ray uh, Mercado from Dayton, Ohio, longtime journalist. Ray, thank you. I'm sorry, he was going to talk there. Me, um, hey, Mark, it's, it's Devin. I just wanted to I just wanted to add that um, you know more than anything, what I see, I just try to step back to fifty thousand feet, and I say. You know, it would be good if we get a higher percentage of us working as a team, right, as a government, as U.S. citizens, three. But I think if we just started with, you know, everything's about opinion now, even more than it was, you know, before this crisis, if we could just get to where 30 percent of the discussions were about factual data, you know, versus it's 90 to 95 percent the news, the so-called news, right? is really opinion, you know, and you get very few facts. And I think what's really um, the opportunity is this is really a science health problem. So 
you really have the opportunity to get into some, you know, unemotional, factual discussions mm -hmm. that if we could That's just good. push that more between conversations like this and in the media, that would really go a long way on getting more people on the same team. Of course, not everybody's going to agree, but that's what's killing us is the opinions. And it's, you always hear, hey, it's not enough or it's good or it's bad. You got to just start talking about, hey, what's the infection rate? What's the number? Let's agree on the facts and then let's move forward. We're just not able to even agree on the facts, which is an issue. So I just wanted to bring that up. I would agree 100% uh, with Devin. And, you know, where I'm currently sitting, um, well, now without traffic, it's different. But uh, normally it would take me 40 minutes to drive to Pennsylvania, 40 minutes to drive to West Virginia, about an hour to drive to Delaware, an hour to drive to Virginia. I have, I don't have the time of the day to follow each of those state capitals and news. Um, uh, so to the point of empowering governors, I certainly buy that. And I'm not suggesting that we're going and driving to those places, but I know for a fact that people at the hospital that we just left three hours ago uh, commute in uh, from multiple different states. Sure. Let alone grocery stores and other places of work, which I do believe should open up, but this needs to be done with some rhyme and reason. Yes, I think it does. I mean, I agree with, with most of what the people have said. You know, Joel, yes, I think people are coming together. Um, at least on a local level, uh, I, oh, I can only speak you know, for Connecticut, but also I think that what Joseph was saying though is that we need to come together more on a national level as well. And um, uh, I, I, just don't, I just don't see that happening. It, and if we open up the country, we need to do so, I think in a very measured way that relies on the data more than just what people might think. Um, you know, or just that they want to do. I, I want the country to be open. You know, I mean, I, it's very difficult. You know, I'm, I live alone. I had all these activities and, you know, I had a whole life built around everything and it was precipitously ended and it's a real challenge now. Uh, so of course, I mean, but I don't want it to be open without uh, some real thought and a, and a real plan. The dad, I agree. I mean, that's all I pay attention to. And yet I see, decisions being made that have nothing to do with the data. Right. I, li I, I live in Iowa. I live in a county that's got 141 people. We're locked down and we've had three deaths and 179 people be infected. It's not, it doesn't seem proportional. Right. And you can go across the states and you start doing the numbers. And one of the hardest numbers to find is how many has been hospitalized? The data is lacking. There's no consistency to the data coming from the states locally. That is, going back to the first gentleman, that's what needs to be coordinated by somebody better than it is right now. I want to, I want to talk about reopening and I want to bring in some of those, some of you haven't gotten a chance to talk yet, but let me ask you to, to raise your hands. I'm going to give you choices, three different choices for reopening or reopening as a nation. I know individual states differ, but is the movement towards reopening happening too fast, too slow, or about the right speed? So raise your hand when I call out each choice. Who, raise your hand if you think it's happening too fast. All right, and raise your hand if you think it's happening too slow. And raise your hand if you think it's just about right. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me go to Lynn Schmidt in the St. Louis area. Lynn is a nurse, and her husband is a doctor who's had, Lynn and I have talked about this, communicated about extraordinary experiences. Lynn, tell everybody about some of the, some of the experiences your husband's having, and then talk about your view of reopening and why you think it may be going a little faster than it should. Sure. So um, my husband is an ER physician. Uh, we live right outside of St. Louis in a more of a rural suburb. Um, and I, I have to say our governor is actually doing a good job um, with what you were talking about, Joe, um, because Missouri is set up that you have the cities of St. Louis on the east and um, Kansas City on the west, and then it's mostly rural farm country in between. And so if there, he, our, our governor did talk about how he has to look at different things, different places, and, and I appreciated, appreciated that, although we still do have a stay-at-home order for the whole state. but. Um, I just wanted to share with my husband. So he really is a hero, my husband. Um, 
he shows up and works the ER and will care for whoever walks through the ER doors. He shows up and um, takes care of patients with COVID and without COVID-19. He shows up and works despite the shortage of PPE. He shows up and has to triage the patients about who can have a test and who can't because there, there just aren't enough testing materials available. He shows up and cares for patients despite it being a threat to his daughter who is immunocompromised. Mm. He shows up and um, it, he's actually had his hours cut and uh, we have a loss of some income and is still being asked to work under extraordinary circumstances. Incredible. And bless uh, him and bless you and bless your family. <laughs> really? Well, really. And thank you. Amen. But um, he showed up yesterday when a patient, uh, 60 years old, came in in cardiac arrest. My husband was able to resuscitate him and keep him alive. And today that man celebrated his 61st birthday. Probably. Um, Probably. <laughs> he will also show up um, to care for the people who are protesting in Jefferson City, our capital today, if they get sick. Um, and all we're really asked to do right now as citizens is to literally not show up so that people like my husband who are heroes can do their amazing work. I want to open this thing up. I'm 74, I'm at risk. I'm a caretaker for my daughter who's 45 and has life threatening. If she gets it, she's not going to survive. I think that responsibility is up to me to protect her. And that's what I've been doing for the last nine years. I don't think the government has the ability to protect my daughter. Okay, any government, that's my job. You know, so. Uh, Even against an unseen enemy? Joe, you've got. No, you've got she's not getting treatment that she should be getting for pain because of the opiate crisis for one thing. The patients that need to be getting it, here goes to the data again. The data says if you're under prescriptions by a doctor, you have about a 3% chance of being addicted. I mean, it's data that's being out there that's being misrepresented. Second thing is, the biggest thing I'm scared of is the fear out here. And as I wrote Mark a couple of days ago, I went through a pandemic. I was only four years old, just real quick. But my dad was taken out on January 7th, 1950. Four days later, died of polio. My mother was five months pregnant. She had five of the rest of us. She picked us up and we had to leave town because of fear, because it was contagious. That's what I see today. Joe, you've got not just your daughter, who you, you, you're so um, great to take care of, but also your grandson is, is college is shut down and he's back staying yeah, with you. He's, as he's back here, thank goodness, because that's why I can be on here because in a few minutes, my daughter goes through her nightly attacks. So, you know, I told Mark, I have to be off by like 10 to seven, my time. Yeah. Just tell people what's this been like for your family, this experience? You would think it's hard. But by the fact that my daughter has had these attacks for 23 straight months in our medical facilities here haven't treated her, we've been in lockdown for basically 23 months. Because yeah. she, she can't go any place. I have to take her just to the doctor's offices. That's like, I only go a few places because I can't leave her for more than an hour. So um, I, I'm used to it. <laughs> We're used to it. Uh, at first, I was kind of cavalier about all this. But three, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I decided I'd better quit worrying about what I think politically and all the other crap that goes with it. And, you know, I've got to protect her because she's not yeah. going to die on my watch. Yeah. Jude Bursch in Fishkill, New York. Just to talk to us about your concerns about reopening. What, what are you concerned about? Well, I'm concerned because I'm in New York. I live in the Hudson River Valley and I'm just north of the city. So I'm very worried about what can travel here, because we're just behind the city in terms of infection rate, and it's actually growing. We're in a very small village called Fishko, but all around us, P Poughkeepsie's just to the north, and the numbers are high and growing each day. They haven't gone down yet at all. And people are 
as Joe said, cavalier about it all. And I'm a little worried. It's a very Republican area. And people tend to be in support of the president, whether it makes sense or not. And I'm very grateful that we have Cuomo as strong as he is and putting together the coalition of the governors in the Northeast, which has been very helpful. Um, so we have some faith there. But I feel really frustrated all the time because any ideas that anybody has seem to go nowhere. I feel like there's nobody around Trump that's listening at all. Uh, so if it weren't for the governors, I think I'd be ready to jump right over the cliff with the rest of the lemmings. Um, but I hope that maybe we'll get ourselves together and do this right. And New York can set an example there as Washington has. Joel, I think Inslee has done a marvelous job, and I love listening to what Newsom does in California. Um, but we're very isolated. Dave and I live in a community of, of families, a lot of older people, but not exclusively. And again, I see everybody kind of cavalierly breaking the rules, and I'm afraid as the areas that open that shouldn't would cause um, a greater number of people here to do the same. I'm very worried about that. Well, one, one thing uh, here in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, we're, we are spread out. So the social distancing uh, mm -hmm. on a daily basis when you're out and about is uh, walking or whatever is very easy. I haven't seen people the few times you go out shopping uh, doing anything that I would say was hazardous. I think people are cooperating here. However, at, at the national level, as frustrated as we may be with President Trump, it's not as if the Democrats have come up with anything useful behind, except for daily backbiting. Uh, you just saw the Senate finally voted on the latest uh, relief package. Uh, and they're going to be throwing barbs at each other uh, leading up, up to the next relief package. Uh, as somebody said, there's no sense that we're all in this together, like what happened mm -hmm. after uh, Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor, where everybody put their partisan differences uh, aside and said, we have a common enemy. Uh, this one is invisible, but we need to come together stop the backbiting, stop the recriminations, just as uh, in, with Pearl Harbor World War II, there were there's plenty of time down the road to investigate, to understand lessons learned, what could have been better, and, uh, and, and so on. But at the national level, I don't see that happening at all, and we have to rely upon our state governments. Yeah, Bill, I, I would just add, and, uh, similar to what Jude was saying about creativity, you know, just take the personalities out of the equation, whether it's, uh, you know, FDA or uh, CDC or the president, it would be awesome if we just kind of knew what the roles and responsibilities were for, you know, the people you'll see at the press conference, because it seems like it just overlaps and, you know, it's what's the governor doing versus federal, or what's, the, you know, what's Dr. Fauci supposed to be doing versus the admiral who's talking. It's, you know, maybe it's real clear, uh, but it's not clear to the American public, right? Mm -hmm. They just let us know, hey, I'm in charge of this, and this is how this is going, you know, kind of uh, pandem pandemic to date. I think that would be a big help. Right. I, I agree with that, and I think that's been shown on, um, in, on various uh, news sites, not just on some, you know, some rather than others, but there is no coordination in terms of uh, procurement of PPE, for example, you know, the states, all the states, red states and blue states complain that they have to bid not only against each other, but they have to bid against the federal government to get uh, some, you know, needed critical PPE. So if there was some coordination, as you say, and I think that's an excellent idea on the state level, I mean, on the federal government level, um, and then if you're right, if we knew exactly who was doing what, it would be um, really helpful. Well, I, I, I think this strikes at a very important <coughs> central theme that's, that's not going to leave us anytime soon. And that is, what is the role of the central government? And then how does that filter down to the state and local? I think there's, um, I think I went into this, if you had done a hypothetical before this, I would have probably said that the federal government would have had an incredibly massive role 
in uh, helping address states that are overwhelmed. That includes that includes the medical um, capability, uh, which I think is is probably number one. I think probably everyone agree would agree too. It's it's unfortunate this would happen in year four of a of a first term president. No matter who the president is, that's not a criticism of the of the current president. I think it's difficult when the president is running for re-election during a year when the greatest crisis in perhaps uh, the last century has, has hit our country. And I think that poses its own issues. I don't know who it was that brought up the idea of the analogy to World War II, but for me, it feels a little bit more like the Civil War. And I'm from the state of Kentucky and I pay a lot of attention to the red state status of many of my friends who are there. And I feel like that battle somehow or another has to play out rather than just calling for unity. And I don't know in what way that could ever happen, but I feel like it's gotta get, gotta get fought somehow and it's being fought, which feels terrible. I mean, the, the protests that put people in danger as well as people disagreeing online and fighting all the time about issues that we really should agree upon, but instead we choose these partisan polls and stay in them. Yeah, um, I'm worried about that. It's a cold civil war, right? It's a cold civil war. One thing has really colored this whole issue for me uh, selfishly is that uh, last year, late last year, last fall, I had a, a really serious viral infection. And um, they described it at the time as uh, a virus of unknown origin. And I will tell you that my wife and I returned from Southeast Asia in uh, February. And when we got back and we're getting back in, in sync with the news and there was a program on where they were describing in great detail, I think it was Sanjay Gupta that was describing it, the symptoms. And my wife looked at me across the room and said, that's what you had. Mm -hmm. And um, I will tell you that it colors everything that I think of about this because I feel like I've been through it. My, my doctor does want to get a, an antibody test for me as soon as those are available because mine was so much earlier than anything that's been talked about so far, but the symptoms are, I don't mean that they're really close, they're exactly the same. And I had every one of them that the people are talking about Probably and true. I thought I was gonna die. A good portion of that time I was by myself, unfortunately, at our home in North Carolina out in the mountains out in the woods by myself, and I wasn't sure I could get to urgent care. I couldn't get a cell phone signal to even call for an ambulance, but. Did you get any treatment? I did. I, I went into, I did get into urgent care, and as soon as I described what I had, they said, here, put this mask on and go sit in that room, and the doc came in, and he said, I'm pretty sure that you've got some kind of really serious viral infection, and I, and I think you got pneumonia. We're probably going to admit you. They ran some tests, and long story short, they decided that I had severe bronchitis and I couldn't breathe. I mean, I couldn't, I, I'm, I'm in pretty good, I'm in really good condition for someone my age, for 67. The doctor regards me as being in excellent physical condition. Um, our home out there, you have to climb some steps and I couldn't walk up more than two steps at a time before I'd sit down and rest. That's how bad it was, so I couldn't breathe. And I re it reminded me of some, uh, some illness charity from some years ago and their tagline it was, if, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. That, that kept going through my head as I was there by myself. So when I start seeing people say, you know, it's not that bad, or let's go out and mix together and take the risk, how bad can it be? Or let's go back to work now. I find myself thinking, if you had had a dose of this, I'm pretty right. sure you would believe that. Let me ask, let me ask uh, all of you again, show of hands. How many of you know someone personally, not heard of someone, but know someone personally, who's been diagnosed as having the virus, raise your hand. Five of you. Um, I wanna go around and, and Ari, we'll start with you. I wanna ask you all, we, we started on an optimistic note with Ari, I wanna, I wanna confront some of the, the fears that people have. Just in a sentence or two, starting with Ari and I'll call on each of you. Tell me what your biggest fear is, not for your family or yourself, but for the country over the rest of this year, okay? Ari, what's your biggest fear for the country this year? You know, I'm really trying to stay positive. Um, that's that, that's that's a tough one. The friction, I mean, earlier in this discussion, the term civil war came up. Um, I'm definitely a history buff. Um, we've watched Plot Against America, which is um, 
Uh, it's just uh, there's a lot of friction out there. Yeah. That's the thing that fear, comes to fear, fear may be the wrong word. How about we'll go with concern uh, or fear, whichever you prefer. Um, Janie, what are you concerned about or, or worried about for the country this year? Uh, that the uh, divisiveness will not end and uh, it will continue and may get worse. Uh, and that um, there, you know, such as there are now, there are protests, which is only a small portion of the population of the, like of the state of Connecticut. It doesn't certainly represent all the people, but they are driving an agenda that may or may not um, be in the best interests of everybody. And I think that's kind of what's lacking. Yeah. Joel, how about you? Uh, a big concern is always at the forefront that with restrictions beginning to be lifted here throughout the next couple of weeks in some states that we find ourselves in the fall having to go right back to facing more lockdowns. And then also what that does for the election. You know, on the fringe, there's talks about the Postal Service here in the state of Washington where, you know, vote by mail only. So it's a big year for the election. And if the country's facing another form of a lockdown here in a few months because everything got adjusted too soon, where does that leave us heading into a pretty important uh, time of the year in November? Yeah. Ray, how about you? Biggest worry, biggest concern? Uh, that data and facts don't matter. Data, people can manipulate data any way they want. And in this polarized society, even though you can put a fact in front of somebody, it doesn't matter because it's always colored by what they believe. So hmm. facts and data, uh, as much as I would love to believe that that's going to drive our thinking and how we reopen the country, it's not. It's going to be who can best manipulate that information to get their message out in the way they want. And I think we know who that is. Devin, I want to ask you, I just want to tell people, you've been furloughed, you're dealing with a lot personally, but what's your worry, your concern for the country? Yeah, so I, I would, um, and I would, if you would have called on me first, I would have said what several of the other people say. It's we need to work together. We have such great resources as a, you know, American team, citizens, government, the part of partisanship that you see it going right down the, the red blue, uh, you know, tracks. And it, it's just a shame, right? Because we're just not going to perform as well as we could um, as a society. And so that's by far my biggest fear. That's None of you so far that, that I've asked have, have mentioned the economy. And I know a lot of people are worried about this. Anybody here feel that the biggest concern that you have about the country this year is that the economy, the, 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 the loss of jobs, the, the, the businesses going away, that, that, is, that that's the biggest problem we face because of all the hardship that'll cause? Yes, I do. I do, Mark. I'm very yeah. worried about Please. my three kids who are in that age group that we depend on for saving the world. And I'm worried one has lost a job in San Francisco. And then I have a, a daughter here in New York who has her own company waiting for that small business loan. And I'm very worried about not just the fact that they might lose that work in the future, but what happens to their spirit in that process. And as we start to recover, if we do, they're harmed. And they're harmed in a way that we all haven't had to suffer yet. And um, we really do count on them for the future. So I'm hoping that being an older person myself, that one of the things that I can do is contribute to their strength in any way that I know how during this time, because it's very, very hard. So they need strong shoulders and people with some experience to keep plugging in spite of the difficulty. Yeah, Jamie, you wanted to talk about the economy? Sure, I'd love to talk about the economy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I want to know how the governor of Georgia is opening up the economy and letting people go into bowling alleys. When did bowling alleys become an essential service? I mean, I think, I mean, it's like a joke. If there's any place where you could possibly get the virus, it would be in the bowling alley between the shoes and putting your fingers in the bowling ball. I mean, right there, you have like, a, you know, just a, a horrible situation, I just like to say. And then, and, I, and then you go out for your massage. And that, right, yes, exactly. And have your nails done. Always, you know, critical <laughs> essential services. But well, I, I think, that, I know, think like Jude, Jude's point, and I, and I really agree with her that uh, my children uh, and subsequently my grandchildren are the ones who are really going to suffer from this. My children, you know, basically now are like second grade dropouts or fifth grade dropouts because they're a third of their school year is over. But, um, you know, their parents are, um, 
you know, not everyone can work from home and they are too suffering and will continue to suffer from the long-term effects of this uh, economic uh, collapse we've had. Never mind, my, uh, you know, I don't want to make this all about me, but I mean, you know, I have an IRA that is like suddenly just tanked and now I, you know, am unsure uh, as, as an older person whether I'll really, you know, will outlive my money. Will I have enough money to live on? I think one thing missing from the debate about reopening the country, uh, presumably it will be slowly and measured, is that I don't see that anyone will be forced to go out of their house to engage in any activity that they're uncomfortable with. And there was a solution proposed here in Arizona by a, uh, a columnist that people who are 65 and older simply have to stay in their house and let the economy reopen. And I had another conversation where my thought with the people who went out on the Jacksonville beaches, they did that on their own free will. No one forced them to go out there. And if uh, in three or four weeks, Jacksonville becomes a hot spot, that will, they will have done a public service in that they'll know that that area is not safe. I hate to be that brutal. If on the other hand, in three to four weeks, there's no upshoot in Jacksonville, that should give us some encouragement that uh, areas are going to be safe. The only way to know if you're comfortable with the ocean water is to start with your toe. Anybody look, anybody, uh, think you go to a restaurant this year? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'd go. Mark, yeah. Mark, my concern with all this is we don't do nuance very well in this country. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, because I think the real answer is between the two extremes. If anyone thinks that we can stay in quarantine for much more time than we are right now, uh, this is going to have catastrophic results on our economy. It's going to affect everyone on this screen and everyone uh, viewing this. I think that's a fact. No one can model it because we've never had anything like this in the modern era. What we are going to need to do is intelligently reopen, intelligently reopen. And that, that involves a laundry list of assets and capability that no one thinks that we have right now. But hey, it's the 50 states of America. It's not a monolithic country. The diversity of the country it strikes along a lot of different lines. And there's going to, you know, I live in Texas. I'm originally from Tennessee and I'm in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina with my wife's family in quarantine here. It's a different view of the world. It's not necessarily right or wrong, but it's a different view. And of course, different states are going to look at this differently. And there could be some great consequences uh, negatively or positively. But to think that the whole country's going to act in concert, no matter who the president is, is, is no way that's going to happen. No. That chart that you put in the newsletter today, Mark, that RT chart, was yeah. really good for looking at how we're going to do it and where we have to be in order to move forward. That's excellent data, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of on a, I'm in Iowa. We have the epicenter right now of three of the largest packing plants in the, war, in the country shut down. That's your food. Mm -hmm. Same thing's going on in Nebraska. Same thing's going on in Minnesota. Same thing's going on in Illinois. This is your pork, your beef, your chicken. 50%, 30% of our beef is imported. From where? Where is most of our processed food? Out of this country. Mm -hmm. People better start realizing, like the gentleman just said, if we don't open this thing up proportionally, and I like to, the gentleman, from, those of us that are older, we need to take responsibility and do our job and stay out of the public square as much as we possibly can and let the young people come in. It's their world, the X's, the millennials, and the Z's. They're going to make the decision of where this country goes forward, not us. And it's time we step aside. I'm a generational person. I believe in generations. And it's time for us to basically do the snaggle puss and exit at stage left. Um, I want to close by um, thanking you all for making time to do it and for engaging in this conversation. I know there are so many topics we didn't get to, and a lot of you had stories that, that I would have liked to have gotten to, but 
we've run out of time, but I, I appreciate you having this conversation. We'll have more of them, hopefully bring some of you back, but also some other readers who wanted to be involved this time but didn't get a chance. But I want to thank you all. Thank your families. Uh, congratulate um, Ari and his wife again. Congratulations, for, um, for Ari. Your new job. Congratulations, Ari. Bless you, Lynn, and your family again. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure. I'm Mark Halpern. We'll see you soon on Why World of News, both uh, online and uh, in your email inbox. Thanks for watching.